Hi, so we're live, and uh, I am Philip Martin. I am the co-owner of Philip Martin Gallery here in Los Angeles with my wife, Portia Hine, who some of you might have met uh, at the gallery or at the art fair. It's uh, nine o'clock here on the left coast, and I'm delighted to see that we have so many people here. This is really nice. Um, I really enjoy uh, knowing that people from around the country and in Europe are co coming to see us and it's a really nice to share everything with you at this time. I'm really excited today to be in conversation with Christy Luck. Christy, how are you doing today? Good, Just waking up. Yeah, well thank you so much for joining us here and inviting us into your studio for a conversation about your work. Uh, Christy and I are both here in the east side of uh, Los Angeles and we don't actually live that far away from one another. Yeah. Um, so I thought today what we would do is uh, go over some of the paintings that Christy has made for Freeze. Uh, this is part of a series of conversations that we are having here at Philip Martin Gallery for the artists that are in our Freeze presentation. I'm incredibly excited about it. We talked with Katie Cowan yesterday and that uh, interview is available online. We had a great conversation about her new works. Tomorrow we're speaking again at 9 a.m. Um, for Holly Coolis, um, who I'm excited to have a conversation with. And then on Thursday, Joanne Petit Ferrer. So uh, just feel free to, to um, email the gallery, you can email staff at Philip Martin Gallery to find those links and to join us. Um, so is there anything I'm not remembering here before we get started? I think we're good. So thank you for joining us. So Christy, um, I know that you're a morning painter. Um, would you be painting now if we were not uh, doing this? Yeah, I think I generally start in the morning. Um, I think that <laughs> quarantine has changed my schedule a little bit now that I have the full day. But ordinarily, yeah. I like daylight. I mean, painting in daylight, so. Does daylight um, influence the way that you, that you make work in any way? Um, I think just that color is important to my work, so it's the best way to, to make it and to see it. Yeah. We're looking here at some of the pictures from our most recent show, which was called Transformer, uh, at the gallery. And we had this show in January during Freeze. Um, we're going to look here soon, shortly at the Freeze works. Um, while we're doing this, tell us a little bit about this show, and we'll come back to the to the works a little bit more later, but tell us a little bit more about this show, uh, Christy, and what were you thinking about it coming off of this show and coming into Freeze? Um, so the work that was in the exhibition um, is a mix of like really, as you can see, really small little eight by 10 paintings and some some larger works. Um, I've only recently started to begin to work larger, I think in the past year. So that was some of my more, um, my, my, some of my largest works that I've done. But that work, I, I worked up until, you know, the show opened. So that was just in January, in the January. Um, and the work from Freeze, which has been the months previous, I think is still related for sure. Um, there are some, I think with what I'm making now, I'm, I am using some of the paintings from that show as a starting point for new work. Um, I've talked to you before about how some paintings, compositions I, I will reuse um, mm -hmm. over and over again. So there are certain paintings from that show that I think will be familiar to people. Um, when they see newer work. Um, but some of the pieces from Freeze, I think, were also a departure. Um, I think like the grid painting and the figure is becoming more prominent in some of the paintings. Um, and like in this case, it's a, the figure is actually active, um, which is the first time I think that's been the case in a painting recently. 
So this painting is called Aurora Head, and this is one of the new paintings for Freeze. I kind of was moving ahead there. You said a bunch of really interesting stuff there about the figure, about returning to compositions, and about the figure being more active. Maybe just starting there in terms of this work, when you talk about the figure being more active, what do you mean by that in a painting like Aurora Head? Um, I think, well, in previous work, uh, and in new work too, um, I've begun using the figure, um, meaning like an entire figure versus just um, a hand or, or a body part, which has some, in the past, I've, has represented the body, has been enough to represent the body. But more recently, the figure as a whole has been in the paintings um, most often horizontally and mm -hmm. not actively. Or mm -hmm. at least, um, yeah, not uh, sort of like standing or so. This so this figure you can tell is sort of active, and I consider it um, part of previous paintings in that there's sort of a head and a braid, which is very it's a very abstracted, but the a braid and a head is is sort of a reoccurring. Um, recurring imagery that I that I use, and so now this figure is sort of in the in the head. Um, so moving over here, um, we've got a kind of a braid or a figure, kind of a very active figure here. Um, mm -hmm. And as you point out, it's a more vertical figure. Um, and then in the next piece, I'm going to skip ahead here just a little bit. In this one, as you point out, the figure's even, even more active, sort of even occupying the space in a very clear way. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about this painting, which is called Erlen. Um, yeah, that is a recent one for Freeze as well. Um, and that piece, I think my paintings are usually contained within the, the rectangle or the square. Um, they typically have been, you know, entire sort of worlds that exist within the frame mm -hmm. and so for this painting I was thinking about how and also I have a tendency to use really organic shapes so straight lines are things that I've always avoided I sort of have these rules loose rules or guidelines for um, creating my compositions but a grid was something that I was curious about as an art trope, I mean, as a as something that's uh, always engaged with in painting, but how I would deal with it, how I would um, still create a sort of world within the frame, even though the composition is insinuating that it extends outside of the frame. That's something that you also mentioned in the conversation we had prior to this, um, this live conversation um, was the point that the assumption that you had realized that many people have is that your compositions are really planned out, but that actually there's an organic kind of growing and changing process as you're painting the painting. Did that happen in this work? Yeah, yeah. There I think this one loosely, um, it, they aren't generally planned. This one, the plan was somehow deal with a grid um, and then make it up as I go, which is generally how I work is that I'm just, I'm just starting. Um, there aren't plans for color. There aren't plans for, you know, an overall like tonality or, or even the imagery. Um, it's, it all stays very malleable and pretty soft for most of the process. Mm -hmm. And only in the last maybe 25% of the paint of, of the painting like life being made does it sort of start to harden into a, a more concrete image. But this particular painting is based off of a small sculpture that I have in my studio on my windowsill. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it's the first time that I've used like a direct object that has um, any sort of like personal significance, but that um, 
yeah, so I wanted this painting to have, to feel like it has a personal significance, but for that significance to be unknowable. So that leads to, to two other questions. And number one, we did consider for the conversation showing some more studio kinds of shots, because I think it's been really interesting for me to look at how you arrange objects, um, you know, like sort of to, to have different color ideas in the studio, not that you're working directly from them, but perhaps a combination that people could say imagine here of colorful bowls or things like that working together, you can see how color relates. And then in this piece, the figure that you're talking about really is only about that, that big. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of a, one interesting point, but are you, so are you saying that say, when, when in the central part, this you realized or saw, or, or maybe for lack of a better description, lived, lived your way into, into this experience of a figure in the center, it, it kind of evolved. And so suddenly there must've been a moment when you were like, oh, I could put a figure in there or tell me about that. Um, it actually, yeah, it, eventually I put one, uh, yeah, I put that in. Um, and it was, there was a possibility of multiples or, you know, it not being just this very uh, sort of central composition. But I sort of stopped fighting, fighting that, and made it the focal, <laughs> made it the focal point, um, because it, yeah, other things weren't resonating. That's yeah, that's I think that's really interesting. Um, so this painting is called Substrate Woman, and uh, of course has a more horizontal um, figure. Mm -hmm. What about this kind of? Tell us a little bit more about how the, how I interpret the what the the body form or the kind of this sort of sh body shape being kind of in a foreground or tell me do you see this as a foreground or is it a stacked layering um, composition of say uh, depth like in a in soil for example? Mm -hmm. um, the way that I dealt with the figure in this was, I think, wanting it to either seem as if a, a figure had been there or is there. Um, so the, the issue of presence, uh, not being sure uh, if, it, if, if it's an, a present figure or if it's the absence of one. Um, and the, I kind of consider it to be a foreground, but it's, I, it's hard to see, I think, in this image, but there's a lot more detail near the bottom of that like brown area, things sort of like crumbling and breaking apart um, into into paint marks. But it also feels sort of like cellular, mm -hmm. um, like plants, and yeah, and soil. Um, so you're saying the brush marks themselves seem cellular. Yeah, yeah. The paint is always very thin, um, but I have areas like in this painting and in others where the brush mark sort of is in the surface in a way that that holds every sort of hair. Kind of, I would liken it to like a thumbprint. Mm -hmm. Sort of allows for like a brush mark that, that is like a thumbprint. That is a conversation too that we've had in the studio is um, a discussion of kind of tool usage, a discussion of the paintbrush as a tool. And um, what I interpreted from what you're saying to be your desire to give the viewer kind of a very direct sense of tool usage in addition to something that's more descriptively representational. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do want the make, you know, the way that it's made to be revealed in certain areas of the painting because I think it's it allows for an access point, but it also um, is a, a form of generosity. I think that gives other people sort of access to my process to yeah the process of making it. Yeah, and maybe to be able to create their own interiority in relationship to what they're also experiencing and navigating. I'm just going to go back here because I, 
We have four works for free. So this one we I kind of skipped because I got I kind of got excited and moved us ahead. But this is of course on the wall behind you. This yeah. is called Bull. Um, and um, this is a painting that really struck me. You can see I also have a a, a painting here that's um, in my home. Um, this painting has this kind of almost totem looking thing that to me could be, you know, it could be a lot of different things. It could be, well, I won't, I don't need to say what I'm, tell us a little bit more about what you're seeing in this painting and how it came together. Well, I'm, I'm curious what you're seeing. What you're seeing. <laughs> um, no, no, no. I, I generally avoid description of a specific, yeah, yeah. of a specific thing. Yeah. Um, and this painting, I actually started uh, with an intention to to hang this painting in my home. I generally don't live with my work, but yeah. this was a piece that I was attempting to make for home. Um, but it, I think that this is a painting that there's more work um, that I'm making that sort of feels this way and has this um, this sort of frame that I that I think is new, that is a new device that, uh, that hasn't been in previous work. Um, well, I think that, you know, there's these interesting questions um, with regard to maybe going totally off topic, but, you know, I'm looking at this, I'm seeing there's a kind of proscenium feeling to it because you kind of have a feeling of like a theater or there's this kind of feeling of a stage that say you could be walking into. You have this beautiful thing that to me looks like um, almost like rep, reptile scales or something like that. But then oddly it's, it's some kind of, um, as I say, it could be a curtain or something. And then that makes me think about something like Orpheus or, and there's so many, so many um, ideas of people wandering in these dream landscapes. And I think my experience with this piece is in a lot of your work, you might find something that you fasten on originally. Like my first thing to me, this kind of looks like a Native American, you know, um, uh, like, a, like a Native American um, head, perhaps, or, you know, something like that that's depicting the natural world. But then later, as it, they, your entry point starts to change, and so this, I start to see something that looks like a bowl or sun, and that, to me, the viewer allows all these different ways to walk around this landscape visually and to continually be re-engaged. Do you find yeah. that your paintings are also changing for you in the same kind of way? Yeah, I think so. I, I do have, um, occasionally I will have a sort of, a representational um, starting point in my mind that that the painting never loses for me because I you know I've seen these paintings through all of their stages and so um, even though it is very different from whatever my sort of signifier was I still hold that in my head so it becomes hard for me sometimes uh, when I'm getting to the end I will I have a few people, friends, or that I will ask, and I will sort of, I want to make sure that the range of like psychological projections that they are putting on it are, are diverse and that it's, it's not, um, that everyone isn't seeing the same thing. I love that. So that's sort of how I, I gauge when a, that's part of how I gauge when a piece is finished is making sure that there is not one predominant um, read on what that is. That is so profound. That is like the beauty of art. I mean, rather than these other situations where we only seem to agree that we've moved on when everyone agrees, you're saying that we move on when we all can have our different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to get tech as a painter, ex-painter, fail painter a little bit. I just want to point out to everyone in the audience the difference between the color here and the color here. Just in terms of the beauty of real painting and the ability to create color in complex darks, for example. So much of how this piece, to me, the central form is framed. 
has everything to do with enjoying the transition through this area over into here. I mean, that's just beautiful. And at a time when here we are looking at paintings virtually and you know, I think it's really interesting. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, I'm gonna move ahead here to a painting that was produced just before Freeze. And here we've taken the liberty or uh, of actually kind of, we're not gonna show a lot of source things, but, well, source isn't the right word, but, but interesting kinds of, of, of um, connections. So this painting is called Tact. And the work on the right is, I'm gonna try to do this, uh, a fan, a Thansias Kirscher from 1600. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit more about this little juxtaposition that, that we have here. Yeah, um, so that reference image is, um, it's like an, a scientific illustration um, by a particular um, scholar from like the 1600s, but I find his illustrations particularly interesting just because of how um, kind of weird they are. They seem to, they, they are studies of landscape and like how water systems work and they are, they're really early. So all of the, um, the beliefs of course are, are wrong and discounted by now. Yeah. But this man tended to look at mountain ranges or, or, um, yeah, landscapes, and he thought that like mountains were the skeletal remains of the earth that the weather was sort of revealing. And so I think, I think that's why, his, I mean, that's why I'm drawn to his drawings is you can yeah. sort of see that he's depicting landscapes like a body in a really peculiar way, um, well, which is something that I relate to. It's one of the other interesting things that something like painting can do as this very tactile, very human made form. I mean, we live at a time when science is assumed. So we're all just like, hey, I know how volcanoes work. When really I don't have the faintest clue how volcanoes work. And you know, this, if I was gonna do a drawing of a volcano and it was supposed to be a cutaway, I mean, I don't think I would do any better than, than that. I mean, that, that looks great to me. Um, but this kind of feeling of observation, fantasy, blurring together is really fascinating. And then this piece, of course, has, again, a figure and a yeah. lot of representations within it. Yeah, that figure is really hard to see in documentation, but it's yeah. um, sort of floating underwater. Yeah, well, we could, uh, we, uh, this is this one I'm going to chalk up to not not having our great our great regular photographer to shoot it shoot it for. <laughs> um, this is a piece that actually did not appear in your show that I thought a lot of people might like to see. Um, found a, hap a happy home, but um, it is called uh, Late Bloomer. We had so many good pictures we could have put in the show, but you really curated that. Um, what are we looking at here? Um, this one is one of the paintings that I've remade. Mm -hmm. um, I think you have the smaller one. I do. Um, yeah. So you had asked about this mode of working, and that I sort of reimagined some of the paintings over and over again, um, which is something I've done uh, with some is one mode of making, I think. So it does serve this very practical purpose for me um, in that like I am learning to paint and I'm practicing in terms of like remaking things. Um, but certain paintings get resolved and they leave my studio, but I don't feel entirely done with them. Um, so I think of it as sort of this process of, of like self-renewal and getting to know getting to know something um, that I could have paintings that I'm sort of re-engaging with, you know, for years. So when and you I, renewal, and I apologize, I didn't mean to, if I cut you off, but what I'm hearing you say is that you are not only able to re-explore a composition as an artist, re-explore a series of color choices, um, tool marking choices, but am I also hearing that in a sense you're revisiting a place that you constructed for yourself? Yeah. Yeah, I think 
of it as like revisiting the same place at like a different time of day or years later. But I also, um, the color and the, you know, the emphasis or the, some, the images do shift and they do change. So it is not like an exact copy, yeah. um, but it is, it is, you can, you can locate it as like the same space. Um, but I, I guess, yeah, I think of it like music too. I mean, the, being like the closest thing you can yeah. do to music in yeah. terms of like a song. Yeah, so you might replay a composition and it's every time you're doing it, you know, you're feeling those feelings again and feeling them in different ways as you tease out how a, a note might feel if you play it longer or shorter or with a different kind mm -hmm. of expression. Um, so we've got about, we're gonna go back into some pain for the show. We clearly have way more images than we could possibly show people. Um, what I, what, what we do want to do is we're going to really only do this for about half an hour. Um, yeah. we obviously do this for a lot longer and we really want to share with people, but, um, I think it's fun to really just enjoy some stuff in depth. So, um, if you want to take a look and see if there's some questions you might see or be able to answer technically, if we can do this coming into the chat, we've been figuring out how to see people's live questions. Those are appreciated. Um, this piece is called um, Black Sun and uh, has a number of new, new, new aspects to the composition, at least to me, that I saw in this piece when you made it. I don't think you had, ex ex had you explored this one before our show? No. Some of these ideas? Just so beautiful. Do you wanna talk to me just a little bit about, you know, what we're, what we're seeing here? Yeah. Um... That painting is, I think you had asked about color and color is sort of narr as a narrative device. Um, yeah. I think that painting is, uh, is functioning in that way for me um, as being incredibly elusive, uh, the documentation versus the, the in-person experience of it. Um, I, I think that um, both the image and the emotional experience are, are a result of, I think, or are guided by the color, which in this painting, and in most, I guess, is I'm attempting to make it so sort of like nuanced uh, right. that it requires intimacy. Um, yeah. Well, it's really fun. I mean, one of the experiences of being an art dealer that is amazing is, number one, the truth to what you were saying earlier about people having totally different um, uh, interpretations. Yeah. You know, you, when you bring stuff from the studio, often the artist, um, you know, you, you've experienced on your own. And then here I have this experience of showing work to, to you know, hundreds of people and shows or, or at art fairs, literally, literally thousands and really learning from people and enjoying these, all these different feelings that people have. But another thing too, that happens in an art gallery, of course, is that I live with the work for such a long time and I see it so many different times. And, and this is a painting that changed so much for me in the contact, in the course of looking at it over time. Um, you had, um, um, all, just I really, really saw really saw this moment that I kind of read as a I read in terms of almost like a 1930s or 20s or 30s illustration or um, a botanical illustration in many ways, but also want to point out for people just this feeling when you're looking at paintings of um, I don't know how to get rid of that so I'm sorry about that guys um, the feeling of looking at paintings of um, of the difference between transparency and pigments and opacity and how your eye really moves through transparent pigments. They appear to kind of go away from you as opposed to more opaque pigments, which really do stop the eye in the same way that they stop the light and all of this kind of stumbling. Mm -hmm. and this is a beautiful painting too. Um, just a really fabulous uh, piece um, that was also in the show called Cloud Throat. And you're doing a few different things in this one. Um, yeah, this one is a reimagine or like a reimagining. Um, 
it's very different from this a previous painting mm -hmm. uh, called Crossing the Water that I did, but it does, that painting was sort of the, the starting point for this one as well. Yeah. Um, well, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. This has been a real pleasure. And I'd like to thank you, Christy, for, um, do, for, for sharing your work with us. This has been a great, great pleasure. Um, I'm looking forward to the next bodies of work and I'm hoping that people get a chance to see what, what we have there for freeze. And um, yeah, thanks so much for, uh, for joining us today. And thank you everyone for coming. Um, really appreciate your taking the time to, uh, to come out or turn on your screen or whatever it is that we do these days. And um, I want to really also just say that one of the pleasures, I guess, of this um, time has been really feeling the power of art and really connecting with people um, at this time of human need and community. So um, thanks very much for coming out and being a part of this. And uh, have a great have a great rest of your day.